Memento Mori is an upcoming tabletop RPG by Two Little Mice, which you may recognize as the creators of Broken Compass, Household, and Outgunned, some of which have won awards, and all of which I've reviewed on this channel. Those games use a sort of fun and approachable gambling D6 dice pool system, but Memento Mori is really a completely different animal. In this game, you play as a drifter in the darkest days of the bubonic plague in 14th century Europe. Each game is meant to last between five to seven sessions, and not really longer than that because of one pretty important detail. Your character starts out as infected. Fortunately, as the disease takes over your mind and body throughout the course of the game, you don't necessarily get weaker. Instead, you gain a small handful of superpowers, and those powers can be anything you can think of that fits within a thematic framework that everyone at the table can agree on. Actually, there are some ambiguities about the game that I can't quite explain in this video because here I'm just going to cover the 84 page quick start for Memento Mori. The full game, at the time of recording, has launched on Backer Kit and will be presented as four very thick, squat tomes in a slipcase, meant to evoke the look and feel of a book from the European Middle Ages. In fact, you can tell even from the interior design of the quick start that the Middle Ages aesthetic is really prevalent and well executed. I guess this is a product from primo artists and creators in Italy, so one should expect them to nail the Dark Ages look pretty well. Just to cut to the chase here, I'm pretty excited about the full game because of not only the pitch perfect presentation quality and the clean, concise rules writing and adventure design, but the actual game mechanics. The game heavily, almost maniacally, focuses on the mental and physical corruption of your character. It's not just one corruption meter that you fill up until you die. Instead, it's an elegant and dynamic path that your character takes towards their inevitable corruption and demise. But let's jump in and look at how the setting makes that happen. So in this setting, all creatures, myths, and legends from European folklore are true. The full game will apparently provide about 50 different creatures, but more importantly, there's an alternate reality that is superimposed over normal reality, and this world is called Beyond the Veil. Your PC is a drifter, with a capital D, and they have the ability to see Beyond the Veil, as well as travel there through hidden gates and passages. And it is from Beyond the Veil where your PCs get their superpowers, or gifts. There's so much that is unique about the basic mechanics of this game that I think I need to keep the character sheet in play here when discussing them. The first aspect you create for your character is their name, and like everything else about your character, it changes over time and becomes corrupted. You're supposed to come up with a first and second name, something descriptive or emblematic of your character. If you can tie your name to a particular test or check where the dice are rolled, you get to add 2d6 to that roll. Every character then comes up with a dream or aspiration. The full version of this game will have rules on how to use this dream to access supernatural powers. The next thing to get sorted is your PC's mark. This is a physical mark that appears on their body, and there are going to be maybe a dozen or more in the core rulebook, each of which comes with a list of keywords. These keywords are later used to come up with your gifts or superpowers as your corruption increases. Your organs, of which there are four, are essentially your core stats in this game. Nerves represent a character's instincts and basic impulses. Cerebrum is their logical reasoning and rationality. Heart is their ability to bear their feelings, unite people, or care for someone in danger. And viscera is sort of the opposite of heart, the PC's tendency to go against their conscience and do horrible things. Each of these organs has either one, two, or three slots. Blood is sort of like your health meter, and it always starts with three slots, one of which is permanently corrupted, as you can see from the filled slot there. I'll get to the corruption mechanics here in a second. Bonds are little positive aspects of a character that lend temporary help towards a check. A character always starts with three, and they always start with two slots each. Virtues are very similar to bonds in that they are a positive trait or ability, which will lend one extra d6 to a check if it can apply. Equipment in this game is an afterthought. So here's how the dice mechanic works. Let's say my character wants to steal a loaf of bread from a shop. If you look at your character sheet, you can always invoke one organ plus your blood, and if the situation fits, either your name, a bond, or a virtue. In this case, I would use my viscera, since stealing bread is a bad thing, plus my blood, which always gets added, and in this case, my virtue of rascal, since stealing bread is also a rascally thing to do. I have two slots in viscera, three in blood, and one in rascal, which means I get to roll six d6s. The goal by default is to roll a five or a six. Those would count as successes. 
Just like with any sufficiently complex dice pool system, sometimes I'll need more than one success with a roll. And due to narrative or environmental factors or even superpowers or curses, I may only have to roll a three or a four to get a success or be required to roll a six to get a success. So here's the thing about those blacked out slots. Those represent corruption in your character. Anytime you're tallying up dice for a check, it's going to be white dice for the open slots and black dice for the filled slots. Here's the kicker. Anytime you roll a six with a black die, you get a dark success, which counts as three successes, but you have to blacken one of your blood slots. And if you roll a one with a black die, that's a dark failure that cancels out another success on that same roll if you had one. As the corruption fills up your blood slots, and this will happen quickly, you will then erase the two filled slots and fill one of the other slots on your character sheet, presumably the one that makes the most sense in the fiction. As the corruption keeps coming at you through your blood, it keeps getting shunted off to your name, your organs, your bonds, and your virtues. It should be noted that you can pick up blood corruption, not just from rolling a six with a black die, but from these things as well, which really does mean the corruption comes at a constant rate in this game. But with corruption comes powers or gifts. The very first time you blacken a slot in your name, bonds, or virtues, you pick up a gift. And the more corruption accumulated in any of those three sections means that gift gets more powerful. Now, there is some guidance here on how to create or come up with these gift superpowers, including, most importantly, the fact that you should use the keywords associated with your mark, I'm hoping the full rulebook fleshes this out with lists of gifts to choose from, since honestly, this is a lot of game design heavy lifting coming up with powers. I thought the corruption of the PC's name was quite interesting. The first corruption to their name eliminates their descriptive last name or epithet. This leads to a gift, of course, as well as a dark epithet that connects with their first name. Then the second time their name is corrupted, they lose their first name and only go by their dark epithet. What's even more interesting is that in the fiction, the character is meant to have forgotten their old name completely, and only their companions remember it. This could be potentially challenging to roleplay, but the idea is that PCs are losing themselves completely, both in body and in mind. Organs fill up with corruption as well, but they create a stigmata rather than a gift. This comes in the form of a deformity, phobia, curse, or mutation that transforms into some kind of dark ability. This ability can be used occasionally, but must be recharged with some dark roleplay, as suggested here. Again, it would be nice to have a list of possible stigmatas to choose from. When virtues are corrupted, they are immediately lost. You do end up with a gift after the first virtue is corrupted, but surprisingly, you can lose all three virtues, and for your character, that means all the memories attached to those virtues as well. This actually happens with bonds too. Once they're fully corrupted, you lose them. But notice that since you have six bond slots to corrupt, your bond gift has six potential levels of power. So this particular power right here would be your most powerful by the end of the PC's sad, sordid life. And check out this sentence right here. It says that when you lose a bond completely to corruption, your drifter will quote, make dangerous statements. They will claim forgotten and forbidden titles. They will have no way to avoid the demons from their corrupted memory. That's an intense feature for players to have to roleplay, but it is certainly one way to illustrate a psyche besieged by dark powers. Although I'm not entirely clear on what gifts will look like in the final game, it's said here that anytime you use a gift, you use a chosen organ plus your blood and all the black slots in the attribute tied to a gift. And remember, anytime you roll a six with a black die, that's more blood corruption. So using gifts begets more corruption. Combat is very straightforward in this game in that you make an attack check, and if you roll a number of successes greater than a stated difficulty, then you deliver the difference as damage in number of HP. If you roll fewer successes than the difficulty for that attack, then you suffer the difference in blood corruption. If you roll the exact same number of successes as the difficulty level, then you deal one HP of damage but pay some kind of price. Dying in this game happens when your very last slot has been blackened. In that last moment, your character becomes an NPC who roams beyond the veil. And really, it's up to the player and GM to make a memorable death scene, such as a character remembering everything from their past or something dramatic. The last 30 or so pages of the quick start are a sample scenario that I don't want to spoil here, but I do want to note how concise and how cleanly the scenario is presented. You're given four pre-generated characters, all drifters who have the disease 
and are on their way to death, but who have one last quest, maybe to set things right a little bit before they go. Again, I don't want to reveal too much, but check out this sort of perfect amount of detail provided to the GM. This highlights only style reminds me of the now classic 5e scenarios written by Kelsey Dion of the Arcane Library and Shadow Dark fame, where she really aimed to provide the most critical information and nothing more. All right, here are my thoughts on the Memento Mori quick start and potential full game. Need more info on gifts and stigmata. I mentioned this a few times already, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what the actual suggested superpowers are for your character. Those can make or break the play experience since they are at the core of the corruption mechanic. Or like one side of the coin. On one side, there is the corruption countdown for your character that you can't avoid. But on the other side, there are these potentially awesome and powerful gifts that you can use to affect the world and kill monsters and stuff. Codex Gigas. This second book is supposed to include dozens of monsters from Beyond the Veil, and I'm curious to see how creative the writers are with creature abilities and tendencies. The hope, of course, is that some of these creatures can be defeated in ways other than violence and combat, because your character in this game can't take all that much damage. Dreams as a mechanic. I would like to see how a PC's stated dream or life's goal manifests mechanically as a gift or power, or however they plan on using it. In the quick start, it's just a narrative detail about your character. Corruption theme executed brilliantly. It almost goes without saying that no other RPG has done corruption the way this game has. You always see corruption as maybe one or two meters that you slowly fill up and occasionally whittle down over the course of play. But this game makes almost every last aspect of your character a corruptible facet that parlays into a dark power. It's just thoroughly thematic and interesting. Dark Ages aesthetic. The interior design and the woodcut style artwork is just so evocative of the time period that the setting takes place in. And from what I can tell of the physical books, they have that sort of old world tome quality to them as well. But even from the quick start, you kind of get the feeling like you're reading a text from the restricted section in the bowels of a private library in the Vatican. Two more books. The quick start mentions the core rule book and the bestiary, but there are also the ex vellum, which loosely translates as from the screen and Arcafati or the Ark of Fate. I don't currently know what Ex Vellum will contain, but I did just find out before wrapping up this video that the Ark of Fati book is not a book at all. It's actually a book shaped box that will contain seven white and seven black specialty D6s you can use with the game, as well as a deck of 22 major arcana tarot cards. The game and the deluxe physical set does all look very promising, but you won't know for sure until you check out their project page on BackerKit. And if everything checks out, you can back it and get your hands on it yourself. Let me know if you've been able to get the scenario in the quick start to your table. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how this game plays. I've left links for everything below. As always, thanks for watching. See ya.